Hello and welcome to a video lecture for pet immunity, test one. So uh, I'm going to share with you my lecture notes here. Uh, they might look a little bit different than the documents that you have in Brightspace, um, but this content's going to be uh, very similar. Um, Andrew just kind of uh, edited some of it um, to make it into different parts for, uh, for Brightspace purposes. So let's uh, first talk about um, infectious agents. So uh, infectious or contagious diseases are diseases that are transmittable by contact with an animal that has it or, or with their bodily discharge. Um, so if the animal is not present, but maybe their feces are or with an object touched by an animal which has it. Uh, and then an infectious agent is the agent that causes the disease. So some examples of agents would be bacteria, uh, viruses, fungi, or parasites. So we're not going to talk about parasites now because we have a whole course coming up about parasites. Uh, but we will focus mostly on bacteria and viruses in this um, in this course. Um, I I'm honestly not sure if we talk about fungi very much at all. So let's talk about bacteria first. So bacteria are single-celled organisms and bacteria are able to reproduce on their own. Um, fortunately for us, bacteria are killed by antibiotics uh, and they are fairly large, much larger than viruses. So you can't see them with the naked eye, but you can easily see them with a regular uh, in-hospital microscope. So they have a few different shapes to them. Um, Oh, never mind. Um, so they have cocci or spheres, uh, or sorry, we have caucus, which is singular, or cocci, which are is plural, and they're like little spheres. So when you look at them under the microscope, they just look like little dots. We also have singular bacillus or uh, plural bas bacilli, and those are rods. So again, under a microscope, they look like kind of little. I mean, they can go in any direction, um, but they're like little um, like lines. So we've got dots here, lines here. And then lastly, we have sp uh, spirulum or spirochetes. And these guys show up as a spiral. So spirochetes are really quite active bacteria often. Um, if an animal has a spirochete infection in their bowel, um, you can see those little guys doing a little dance all across your microscope slide. They're kind of fun, like fun to watch, but not fun for the animal. And then viruses. So viruses are not really technically a living thing. Um, they're basically just genetic material uh, surrounded by a protein coat. So that protein coat is called a capsid and the genetic material can be either DNA or RNA. Uh, so viruses need a host cell to be able to reproduce. Um, so they are not really very viable on their own. They need um, like a living cell to be able to do anything. Viruses, unfortunately for us, are not affected by antibiotics. So taking an antibiotic for a viral infection isn't going to do anything for that infection. Viruses are much smaller than bacteria. Um, like I don't think you can see, you can see them with like an electron scanning microscope or something, but I don't think you can really see them with your typical in hospital microscope. And they have a few different shapes as well. Uh, so some of them are fairly simple, like the helical looks like a little spring. We have the icosahedral, which is a 20 sided protein capsid. These drawings aren't great, um, but you know, picture like if you ever seen those D&D &D dice, right, where they have all the different sides and you roll it, there's like 20 sided ones, looks like that. And then you can have complex ones where it's kind of like a combination. You see you've got your capsid up here, your icosahedral, you've got your helical uh, shape here, and they got the like, kind of little leg things. They're almost like a little light bulb with legs. So uh, different viruses have different shapes. So, um, RNA viruses are more difficult to treat than a DNA virus. So um, these two stand for DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid and then RNA is ribonucleic acid. So it's good to know if it's an RNA or a DNA virus because then um, we can approach treatment in different ways. So 
in order for a virus to cause disease, there's a few steps they need to do. Number one, they need to enter the host body. So that's where we start to talk about um, transmission methods. Once it is inside the host's body, that virus needs to bind to the host cell. Then it needs to get inside the cell. And once it's inside the cell, it's gonna do some replication stuff. And eventually it is likely going to destroy the cell. So to replicate and release, we do all those first few steps, enter, bind, enter the body, bind to the cell, enter the cell. Then the host, uh, sorry, the virus is gonna make the host cell transcribe, translate, and replicate its genetic material, and that creates new viruses. So instead of the cell doing what it would usually do, basically the virus kind of hijacks its systems and gets it to do its work of replication. Then this cell is destroyed and bursts open, and that releases all those new little baby viruses, and then those viruses can go next door to other cells and infect those ones. They can also exit the body and infect other animals. And then fungus, again, we don't talk about fungus too, too much, but fungus are quite large. They're usually visible to the naked eye. Um, like think about like your bread molds and stuff. Um, they are um, unique because they absorb nutrition or, or nutrients from whatever they're growing on. So they're definitely like a little uh, parasite. Um, and they're able to reproduce in a variety of different ways. So they're capable of budding. So think like yeasts, yeasts bud. Uh, fragmentation, so that's with those hyphae. So the hyphae are, like if you've seen bread mold, the fuzziness to it, those are hyphae. Um, they're able to reproduce via spores, which are kind of like encapsulated um, little fungus. And then um, they have the option of being asexual or sexual. And then fungus are treated with antifungals. Fungal infections are obnoxious because they take a long time to treat. An antibiotic will usually treat an anti or a bacteria infection in 10 to 14 days. Uh, a fungal uh, infection will often need three plus weeks of treatment. So a couple terminology terms here that we use when we're talking about infectious illness. So the host, that's the organism that's infected with the contagious disease. Um, and shedding is when that host is passing the virus or the bacteria in their bodily, bodily fluids. Um, so shedding is just what you would think it is. It's shedding. It's leaving those virus or bacteria behind for the next person or animal to pick up. And then infection is when there's a multiplication of organisms in the body, and that will usually lead to disease. So we talk about the incubation period. Uh, the incubation period is the period between exposure to the infection and the appearance of the first symptoms. So um, to hit a really topical example, COVID-19, the incubation period is about two weeks. That's why we have people um, self-quarantining for two weeks after travel, um, or if they have any signs of illness, that kind of thing, we want them uh, isolated for two weeks so that they aren't spreading that illness to other people. So between contracting the infection and showing your first signs of illness, that's the incubation period. Um, so a vector, a vector is an animal that transmits the disease uh, often without being clinically affected. So another term for the vector is the reservoir. So there's a few ways to be a vector. Um, do we talk about the differences? I can't remember if we do in this one. Um, I think we do more in um, parasitology. Uh, but you can have a mechanical vector, which means that it is um, an animal that transmits the illness by it being on the outside of their body. And then we have biological vectors. And biological vectors keep that um, that disease agent within their body, often helping it to mature and then spread it to others. So a great example of a biological vector is um, the tick that causes Lyme disease. So Lyme disease is caused by a little bacteria and it's transmitted by a teeny tiny deer tick. Uh, so that is an animal, it's not sick with Lyme disease, but it's transmitting that Lyme disease to other animals, okay? 
Um, I think an interesting were or an interesting case of a vector or reservoir. Oh, sorry, I guess we have another definition for reservoir. An organism in which a disease causing agent lives and multiplies without damaging its host, so a long term carrier. So perhaps you've heard the story of Typhoid Mary. Uh, I think this is a really interesting um, story of a reservoir. So this is, um, I honestly couldn't tell you the year, but it's old history. It's old American history, I'm pretty sure. But uh, Typhoid Mary had um, immigrated to the US and she was um, working as a cook in hospital kitchens. And then all the people around her and all the people she was cooking for, because apparently way back when people didn't wash their hands after using the bathroom and then would cook food, um, she was spreading typhoid um, to the patients in the hospital and the, her coworkers. Um, but she was never ever sick with typhoid. And um, they kind of did some investigations. She was banned from working in hospitals. She would change her name, work in a different hospital. People would get sick again, etc. Eventually, Typhoid Mary died, but not of typhoid. Um, and they did like an autopsy on her and discovered that she had living, alive ty typhoid virus in her body um, that she was not spreading around or that she was spreading around to other people, but that wasn't affecting her. So I think that's a really interesting um, reservoir case. So you should look that one up if you're interested in it. I learned about it from that drunk history show. I don't know if you ever watched that one, but um, I thought that was an interesting story. So an endemic illness is an illness that's constantly in a particular area. So Manitoba is a hot spot for certain endemic illnesses. Things like heartworm, that, I mean, that's a parasite, but we, are, we have heartworm endemic to our area. Um, we have Lyme disease in the ticks in our area. They're constantly around. Um, in like the Ontario Lake of the Woods area, there's a fungus called blastomycosis. That's endemic to that area. And we also have rabies, a virus that's constantly in our particular area. So that's an endemic illness. It's present in the wildlife. You're really unlikely to get rid of it. It's constant in the area. And then um, a fomite. That's an inanimate object that transmits a disease. So we're probably pretty familiar with fomites at this point, talking about stuff um, to do with COVID-19 because people are pretty paranoid about high touch areas, right? That's because those high touch areas have the potential to transmit illnesses. So in the hospital, fomites are things like blankets, dishes, litter boxes, anything the animals are in contact with, kennels, um, that are an inanimate object that they could potentially pick up an illness from. Um, and then we talk about transmission. So there's two different types of transmission, an indirect transmission and direct transmission. So if you think of direct transmission, uh, if you think of it as contact with an infected animal is necessary, then you'll think of things like fighting or biting, right? Like you need to be in contact with an animal to fight or bite them. Licking or mutual grooming. Um, oh, I mean, we should scratch litter box sharing. That's more indirect. Um, female to their offspring, right? That's a direct contact. And then sexually. So um, you need that other, the other um, infected animal to get sick from that, right? And then if we think of indirect transmission as that contact with the specific infected animal is not necessary, that's when you'll think of things like aerosol. Um, so, you know, someone coughs or sneezes and then you breathe that in. That doesn't necessarily have to be that you had contact with that person or animal. Uh, fecal or urine oral routes. So again, dogs sniffing around at the park after your dog that sick has left a feces deposit and that animal sniffs around or licks at it, they're able to pick up that illness from your animal without your animal being present. Um, skin contact with urine or feces or any kind of um, infectious um, uh, bodily fluid. And then fomites, right? Fomites we just talked about are inanimate objects that transmit disease. Um, and then blood transfusions. So sometimes people get a little bit confused with blood transfusions because 
they feel like that you need that direct contact with the animal. But that is not true, right? Because we can collect blood weeks before it's used. And if that animal was sick with something and then we transfuse it into another animal a few weeks later, um, we can give that illness to that uh, new animal. And we don't need to have contact with the other animal for that. It's just with their blood. So that's an indirect transmission. So we have a few transmission types then. So aerosol is from airborne particles. So think coughing and sneezing, right? I think everyone's pretty paranoid about aerosol transmission right now with COVID-19. That's why everyone's got the masks going on, right? To try to protect ourselves and others from airborne particles. Uh, fecal oral or urine oral is exactly what you think it is. Contact with feces or urine and the mouth. Um, most of the time it isn't that someone or an animal um, went ahead and just ate some poop or drank some urine. Usually it's an incidental um, transmission. So cleaning up um, some feces and then not washing your hands and then eating a sandwich is potential for fecal oral transmission. Um, maybe you cleaned up feces with bare hands or were digging in the garden with bare hands wash your hands but you got that junk under your nails right and then you're biting your nails later that's fecal oral okay um you can have saliva to blood so that's via bites or sometimes it could be licking wounds so saliva to blood is a um transmission method for rabies that you have to you have to be bit to get that rabies transmission and then blood to blood, which can happen um, during bites or fights, um, if blood is mixing while two animals are fighting or via transfusions. There's the option, of course, of in utero going across the placenta. So sometimes the placenta protects the animal, um, like the little fetus from whatever infectious agents are in the body, um, but not always. There are some agents that are able to cross the placenta. And then lactation, so where puppies or kittens pick up the illness through milk ingestion. Um, so again, some things pass through the milk and some things don't, it depends on the illness. And then lastly, sexually, um, so just as humans have STIs that they can catch, so do animals. So um, that's kind of our introduction stuff. Let's talk about immunity specifically now. So, we have two types of immunity that we talk about, active immunity and passive immunity. So active immunity is where the animal's own immune system has produced the immunity. Uh, so usually that means that the animal is producing antibodies to a pathogen. So a pathogen, remember the word patho means disease, gen means causing. So um, a pathogen is the disease causing agent. Uh, so the animal is producing antibodies to that. That can be because they were either exposed to the disease directly or because they've been given a vaccine. Uh, and then passive immunity is immunity that's produced by providing an animal with the antibodies or immunologic cells. So for example, colostrum. I uh, can't remember if we talked, I think we did uh, talk about colostrum in our AMP course. Remember that colostrum is that first milk that the mother makes, that she passes antibodies um, and immunity through that milk to her offspring. Uh, so that is one way to get passive immunity. Those antibodies are going to be present in the body, fighting off any um, exposures to those pathogens that come up. The problem with passive immunity though, is that eventually antibodies, they die off. So if the body isn't able to replace them like they can with active immunity, passive immunity is a temporary solution to immunity. Um, and then I have a couple examples here. So vaccines is an example of an artificially acquired uh, humoral immunity. And then um, a mother to offspring, so like via milk, that's a naturally acquired humoral immunity, okay? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that humoral immunity a little further down. Uh, so um, an antibody that, we've talked about this already in the Im immunity, or active and passive immunity. So what is an antibody exactly? So these are also known as immunoglobulins. 
They're small disease fighting proteins and they're made in response to foreign agents. Uh, so antibodies are specific to the certain antigen. Um, good, we have a de uh, definition of antigen right below here. An antigen is the molecular structure on the surface of a foreign agent that stimulates production of antibodies. So if you think of an antigen as a hat, um, the hat is the thing that that agent is wearing, okay? Um, so rabies has a specific hat um, and distemper has a specific hat. So the antibodies the body makes is responding to those hats, okay? So they don't respond to the whole virus or the whole bacteria, but they do respond to the antigen or the hat that that agent is wearing, okay? So the body has a few different layers against foreign invaders. We have innate immunity. Innate immunity is a pretty standard immunity that um, is going to kick in for any illness that the body is facing. So we have, for example, mechanical or physical surface barriers, things like our skin and our mucous membranes. We've talked about the skin being our largest organ in the body. We talked about one of the functions of the skin as being protective. Animals that have um, unhealthy skin, maybe they have allergy issues or they have wounds, they're much more likely to get infections because that skin isn't acting as a protective surface barrier. So that's our mechanical barriers. So the skin is keeping everything out. It doesn't matter what it is, the skin is trying to keep it all out. So it's not a specific immunity. It's, it's um, part of just generalized immunity. And then we have internal defenses. So things like white blood cells, WBCs is white blood cells. There's two different types that are involved, neutrophils and macrophages. Both those guys, they like to do things like um, eating up bacteria or damaged cells. They're, um, they're phagocytes, so they eat, they're cell eating, right? They eat up other, other cells. Things like inflammation is a, is a type of defense against illness. So inflammation, remember the sign, well, maybe we haven't talked about the signs of inflammation yet, but the signs, the cardinal signs of inflammation are redness, swelling, um, pain at the site. Uh, so those kind of things can help to fight, um, fight off foreign invaders. Fever as well. When the, when the body temperature rises, it's the body attempting to kill off those foreign invaders. And then as well, our body has enzymes that can be used to try to uh, kill off um, those uh, foreign invaders coming into the body. Then we talk about adaptive immunity. And adaptive immunity is where our antibodies come in. So there's two different types of antibodies, B and T cells. So let's explain those a little bit down here. So B cells are called lymphocytes. That's a type of white blood cell. It's the name for them or they're sometimes called plasma cells. These B sites produce antibodies, right? B cells, antibodies. And those antibodies are specific to the antigen. This is called humoral immunity, okay? So you can see my little diagram here. This is an antibody and it has an antigen binding site. It's a specific shape. It will only interact with the antigen that's that same shape, okay? So this, if this is the rabies antigen um, and this is the rabies antibody, that hat, remember we talked about the hat being like the, um, the marking point of that uh, virus, this antigen is going to look around for things to fit in there. A triangle hat, no that's not the right one, circle hat, nope, oh here's a square, I'm going to bind to that and destroy it. Once those two things are bound, we call that an immune complex. Those B cells could um, kill off that antigen on its own, or sometimes it does uh, get the help from other, other sources in the body. T cells, T cells are also in lymphocytes, and these guys are going to either destroy the antigen directly, or they activate other T cells to produce lymphokines. These are chemical messages that call those neutrophils and macrophages and other phagocytes to eat the antigen. This is called cell mediated immunity. So um, T cells are not specific 
the way our B cells are, okay? B cells are only gonna interact with the antigen that they're built for. T cells, they will party with any antigen they find. Anything weird, they're gonna try to get rid of it. So cell-mediated immunity, that's from the T cells, and then our humoral immunity, which is involving the antibodies, that's our B cells. So uh, I have a little um, flow chart here for you that shows you those layers of defense, okay? So layers of defense, we can talk about our innate defenses. Innate defenses are broken into mechanical or physical and internal defenses. So our mechanical or physical example is those surface barriers of the skin, the mucous membranes. Our internal defenses, some examples are the white blood cells, so those neutrophils and macrophages, inflammation, fever, and enzymes. Um, so we had innate and adaptive defense. If we talk about our adaptive defense, we're talking about humoral immunity, and we're talking about uh, cell-mediated immunity. So humoral immunity is our B cells. Those are the guys making the antibodies. Our cell-mediated immunity is run by those T cells, okay? So innate defenses, innate means it's just, it's there, it's always present. And then adaptive defenses, those are adapting and changing based on what, what antigens or what viruses, et cetera, are present. So innate is always there, adaptive changes um, as it's needed. And then I have another flow chart for you. And this is our humoral immunity flow chart. So when we talk about humoral immunity, that's these B cells, okay? B cells, remember, are making those antibodies. So when we talk about humoral immunity, it's also called acquired immunity. And it's acquired because we have to either actively get it or passively be given it. So let's talk about active first. We can talk about naturally acquired active immunity. That is when we've gotten an actual infection or we've had contact with an actual pathogen. So again, just tapping into our coronavirus because it's so topical. If you were to encounter coronavirus, recover from it, and then be immune to it, that would be because you have a naturally acquired active humoral immunity. You can also artificially acquire an active immunity. And artificially getting it is coming in contact with a vaccine. Um, vaccines usually include dead or attenuated pathogens. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. So basically, active immunity is the animal's own immune system providing the protection. And active immunity is um, self-perpetuating. Um, that means that you can replace the antibodies as they're used, okay? So um, if whether you've got, oh shoot, sorry. God, my cat, get down, maniac. Sorry about that. Too bad I don't know editing, I would edit that out. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, <laughs> silly kitty. Um, so <laughs> anyway, I'm totally lost my train of thought now. So active immunity, yes, okay, so that means that we can replace those antibodies as they're used, okay? So whether it's naturally or artificially acquired, our body is making those antibodies. So we can make more. There's more where that came from. Now, if we talk about passive humoral immunity, we can talk about it either being naturally acquired or artificially acquired. So a naturally acquired means that you are being provided the antibodies in a natural way. Uh, so maybe the antibodies have come from the mother to the fetus, either through the placenta or through the colostrum. Um, this is just a note reminding you that colostrum has antibodies in it for the first 36 to 48 hours. So it's that um, first milk that comes in after the babies are born. Or it could be artificially inquired, acquired. So artificially acquired would mean that we're giving injections of exogenous antibodies. So exogenous, so exo meaning from outside, and gen is created, right? Exo uh, exogenous. Uh, sorry, I'm just laughing at my silly pronunciation there. Exogenous means that it's made, it's made outside of the body. So if we inject exogenous antibodies 
for example, from a bone marrow transplant or a state snake antivenins, that gives a passive immunity that's artificially acquired, okay? So passive immunity means that the antibodies have been provided to the animal. Um, the problem with that is that those antibodies are not replaced once they're used because the animal doesn't have any way of replacing them. So let's talk a little bit more about that passive immunity. So maternal antibodies is a, a big topic when we're talking about puppy or kitten vaccination. So maternal antibodies are provided from the mother, typically uh, coming through the um, milk, so that colostrum. So those antibodies from the mother are going to circulate in the newborn for a few weeks. Um, over time though, those antibodies are going to start to die off because they don't live forever. And um, there will be a period of several days to weeks where there are not enough antibodies to provide protection to the animal. Um, but there's too many antibodies to allow the vaccine to work. So I've got a little chart to show you that explains that. So these maternal antibodies is going to vary between litter to litter and even between individuals. Everyone is going to have their own experience of this window. And that, that period of time when they're not protected by maternal antibodies, but the internal or maternal antibodies are foiling our vaccine efforts, that's called the window of susceptibility. Susceptibility means that they can get sick from it. Um, so during this window, uh, so during this window of susceptibility, that does mean that if a puppy or a kitten has been vaccinated, they could still potentially get sick from the illness. So I have a little diagram here to share with you. So if uh, we look along this axis here, we have our age in weeks. Um, and then this level here, this is our uh, level of antibodies. Okay. So, um, as we go along at birth, that puppy or that kitten is going to get um, antibodies from the mother, those maternal antibodies. So those levels are high at first, but as those antibodies start to either be used up or to die off, that number is going to start getting lower and lower. Now there's this level called the interfering antibody level. So when antibodies are in this zone, they're not going to be protective but they're going to interfere with vaccination, okay? So it's in this little spot here that that window of susceptibility lives. So typically, that's between that eight to 12 weeks. Eight and 12 weeks are both times that we give vaccines. So that eight week mark, we very, we, the animal very well might not be getting much of a benefit from that vaccine. They may, because if this is a little bit of a steeper chart, at eight weeks they might be below this window of susceptibility and get that vaccine and still be fine. But there's a good chance that they, it will be interfering. So what do I mean by interfering? I mean that as long as numbers are above this dot dot dot, the animal is going to be protected. Anything below this dot 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 means that they're not protective. Anything above this level, we're going, um, sorry, anything in between those two levels, the vaccine isn't going to be able to respond, okay? Not until it gets below this level. So in this space here, like if this is zero, right? If there's zero antibodies at this point, but there's some antibodies here, during this time, any vaccine you give those antibodies are going to eat up all those little antigens and not let them create that active immunity. It isn't until that level reaches down here below this interfering level that when we give a vaccine that uh, that body is able to respond. Okay, so maternal antibodies are coming lower and lower and lower. At this point, they're no longer protecting the animal, but they're destroying our vaccination. At this point, it's not protecting the animal and it's not destroying the vaccine. So when we give the vaccination, the body's able to respond, okay? So it's in this window here between eight and 12 weeks that we have a window of susceptibility. Why is this important? Because 
Owners will call you and say, oh, my breeder said he's all up to date on vaccines. She gave him vaccines at two, four, and six weeks. So at two weeks, protected by maternal antibodies, those antibodies are going to eat up all that vaccine. At four weeks, same thing. At six weeks, same thing. So those vaccines did nothing for that puppy and they have no active immunity. Another thing that might happen is that owners will come in, they'll get their eight week vaccines and they'd be like, great, so is he up to date? Can he go to the dog park now? Can he go visit my auntie's dog, my cousin's dog, my friend's dog, random dogs at the park? And your answer is no, actually. While this vaccine may be offering some protection, it isn't until we're able to give that next vaccine at 12 weeks that we can be sure that the body is able to respond to the vaccine. Okay, so we don't want people still going to the dog park and stuff until those vaccine series is more complete. So at eight weeks, that puppy is not considered protected, even though they've had one vaccine. And that's possible because that vaccine might have done nothing. So that's, um, that's how maternal antibodies and that pr maternal provided immunity works and how it affects our ability to vaccinate pu pups and kittens to keep them safe. So let's talk about vaccination. So vaccination as a noun is the act of giving a vaccine, okay? Um, and what is a vaccine? No, we don't really, I guess, define that, but a vaccine um, contains damaged or killed or changed versions of the virus or the bacteria that we're trying to protect the animal against. We make it so that the bacteria or the um, whatever infectious agent isn't able to cause infection but is able to create an active immune response. So immunization is rendering an animal protected against a certain disease. It is possible to vaccinate without immunizing. Vaccinating is just giving the vaccine. There's sometimes situations where we are not going to immunize the animal or protect them against the disease. One of those examples is right here with the maternal antibodies. Core vaccines are vaccines that should be given to all animals of a species. Uh, so for example, we want to give all dogs and all cats a rabies vaccine. A non-core vaccine should only be given to animals if they are at an increased risk of exposure. So for example, Lyme disease. Uh, while ticks are present anywhere that birds can go, um, the likelihood of your little Yorkie that really rarely leaves your apartment getting uh, Lyme disease is pretty slim. Um, so is it necessary to vaccinate that guy? No. But like your lab that you take out hunting with you and is running through all the long grass all the time, running through the leaf litter, that dog is at increased risk. So that's a dog that we would give those no that non-core vaccine of Lyme to. And then an antibody titer, that's a blood test that measures the amount of antibodies to a specific antigen. Why would we wanna do an antibody titer? Um, well, you guys are gonna do an antibody titer after you get your rabies vaccines to know if you're protected against rabies. Uh, we wanna check if there are protective levels of antibodies in the blood system so that if you were exposed to that illness, you would likely be protected. Um, in animals, we might need to do an antibody titer if we don't know if the vaccine has worked for them or if um, we are unable to vaccinate the animal uh, for reasons like maybe they have an allergy or something to a vaccine. We want to see if they're still protected. So what are our overall objectives of vaccinations? So we want to vaccinate each animal only against the infectious agents to which it has a realistic risk of exposure. So again, that's where we get into that non-core, right? We don't need to vaccinate that Yorkie for Lyme. It's probably not gonna get that. Uh, we also wanna vaccinate against infectious agents that cause significant disease. So rabies, for example, is one that, are you that likely to encounter well, maybe I shouldn't use rabies for this example. Um, let's use distemper for this example. So distemper, are you that likely to encounter it? Maybe not. Um, like I've never seen distemper in my career, but I mean, a big part of that is because we vaccinate so well against it. But distemper, over 90% of animals that catch distemper die from it. It's a significant disease. 
the 10% that do live are chronically affected after. So it makes sense to vaccinate against that illness because it's really significant. Uh, same with parvo, right? Like parvo is an illness that can kill puppies. It's really aggressive. It really damages that individual and it's really expensive to treat. Um, so let's vaccinate against it. It costs $16 to vaccinate and then your dog doesn't catch it. Way better than treating it. We want to vaccinate only when the benefits outweigh the risks. So there are situations, I gave you an example of allergies. If an animal is allergic um, or has like an immune uh, illness, we might not want to vaccinate because we could be putting that animal at more greater risk than what we had, would anticipate if they, can, if they came into contact with the illness. We also want to vaccinate only as frequently as necessary. This is one I really um, want to highlight here. Often in the past, veterinary medicine had an approach of you need to vaccinate every year because that's a way to get the animals in for their annual wellness exam. Animals should be, should be seen every year by a veterinarian at least, if not many times in the year if they have illnesses going on. So that was a like motivation to try to get people to come in. They're due for their vaccines, let's get them examined. The problem with that approach is that often we end up way over vaccinating animals. We're not doing any benefit by giving them extra vaccine. They don't need it. So in the last, like I would say 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of research into how long vaccines last for. And there's a ton of them now that are on label saying that we guarantee this animal will have protective immunity for three years. So that means we only need to give that vaccine once every three years. So does that mean that owners only need to bring their pets in once every three years? No. So what we can do is instead of giving three vaccines once every three years, we can give one vaccine once every year. So um, let's say we're doing distemper, rabies, and parvo. Those are all good for three years. We can give distemper year one, parvo year two, rabies year three, start over again. So the animal still comes in for their annual exam, but only gets one three-year vaccine every year. So um, that way we're vaccinating only as frequently as necessary. We're not over vaccinating the animals. One of our goals is to vaccinate the greatest number of animals in a population as possible. The more animals vaccinated, the more protected the animals that don't have immunity are. That's called herd immunity. Um, again, you're probably hearing mention of this in the news and stuff because of coronavirus. Um, so that's something that has been talked about is how many people have to get sick and then build immunity before we'll see this, uh, this illness go away. Um, before the rest of the population is protected, those that haven't caught it because the ones that have are killing off those, um, those infectious agents for them. And then lastly, our number six, is we want to vaccinate to protect human and public health. And that's where my example of rabies comes in. So is it that likely that your pet will contract rabies from a wild animal? Potentially, they could. In the city, pretty unlikely. But if they did, you are in very close contact with your animal. Um, your dog sitting on your lap and licking your face and whatever. It's there's a lot of potential there for you to become infected because of your animal. So we want to protect human and public health by vaccinating for rabies. Uh, so let's talk about vaccine efficacy or how effective vaccines are. So the more vaccinated animals there are in a population, the less likely that the disease will spread. So that's that herd immunity I said. So um, research shows that if 70% of dogs in a population are immune to rabies, that rabies will drop to zero in the population. So only 70% have to have, have protective immunity against rabies for that population to end up with zero occurrences of rabies. So that's pretty amazing. Um, the problem is that some vaccines will protect, uh, protect against all known strains and others will protect only against certain strains. A really great example of that is the human flu vaccine. So, so how many people do you know refuse to get the flu vaccine because it's not like it works anyway. 
it does work against the agents that are in the vaccine. But if there's a new flu virus out that is not included in that vaccine, it's not going to be protective against it because it doesn't protect all the strains, just the ones that are in there. So that's a good example of that one. Um, and there is also poten potential for vaccine failure. So in that case, the animal has been vaccinated for the disease, but can still acquire the disease. So I have uh, some notes on that. Likely it's not the vaccine that's the problem. Probably something is wrong with the body's response to the vaccine. Um, so I have, for example, of 100% of individuals vaccinated for canine distemper, um, uh, at least 90% are actually protected. So that means 10% don't develop immunity. So I, um, I have been vaccinated for German measles, um, I don't know, a ton of times. While I was pregnant with my first child, they tested my titers um, to see if uh, I had immunity there, if I needed um, a booster, and I had no immunity to it. So they gave me a booster. And then I had my second child and they checked my titers again for it and I had no immunity again. So I've been vaccinated for it a bunch of times and I've never developed immunity to it. So is there a problem with every single one of those vaccines I received? Nope. My body just does not recognize German measles as a um, foreign agent, I guess. It just doesn't do anything when it's in my body. So that's a vaccine failure, but it's not... Um, it's not due to the vaccine. So vaccine failures can be caused by a few things. It could be caused by maternal antibodies. Uh, we talked about that window of susceptibility, right? If the levels are too high, they're just gonna block the vaccine. Those antibodies are gonna um, kill off all the, uh, all the antigens. Um, it may be that immunity just didn't have enough time to develop yet. It could take anywhere between days and weeks for the body to re actually respond and start building antibodies. It could be that the animal contracted a different strain than the one that the vaccine protects for. It could be that there was a problem with the vaccine itself. Maybe it was physically damaged in some way and, um, and the body didn't recognize it or, or, uh, or build antibodies against it. It could be that it was delivered via the incorrect route of administration. So if it was designed to be given, let's say subcutaneously, but you gave it into a muscle, maybe it's not going to do anything. Um, maybe you didn't get enough. So Bordetella is one that goes intranasal. Often you, half of it spills all over the dog and then he sneezes out the other half. Did he get any um, protection from that vaccine? Likely not. It could be that the owners did not adhere to the vaccine schedule, and we'll talk about those schedules a little later on. It could be that there's variation in breed. Maybe they just don't respond well to that vaccine. Um, or they're really susceptible to the illness. Like one example is like Dobermans and Rottweilers are really prone to parvovirus. Um, even if they've been vaccinated, often they'll still catch it. It could be that the individual is immunocompromised in some way, and if that's the case, then they're likely not gonna build immunity to the illness. If an animal has a concurrent infection or fever, that means that they're sick at the same time as vaccination, um, the body's probably not really gonna respond well to the vaccine. That's one reason we always insist on doing an exam at the same time as vaccinating, because we wanna make sure that the animal is going to be able to handle getting that vaccine and be able to build the response. So if an animal has a fever, that indicates to us that it's fighting another infection. We don't wanna give it another thing to have to fight off. And nutritional status. So if you have an animal that's severely malnourished, they're not as likely to respond to the vaccine. If they have a protein deficiency, their body's gonna have a hard time making little proteins of antibodies to respond to the vaccine. So duration of immunity, how long does immunity last when we give a vaccine? So length of protection is gonna vary by vaccination and it's gonna vary by brand. Uh, so you need to look at the label to see how long they're promising immunity will last for. So it's a pretty complex issue. It involves a lot of research. 
we need to determine how many animals need to be immune to prevent a disease outbreak. So right, we talked about that 70% of dogs will cause um, uh, occurrences of rabies to be zero. And we need to determine then how often the animals need to be vaccinated to keep that portion protected. So it's a pretty complex calculation. Uh, it's also going to depend on how long memory cells live for. Um, so an animal could have low or no antibodies, but have memory cells. Memory cells are going to kick into action and provide protective immunity, even if there aren't active antibodies at that time. They're going to kick that antibody production into overdrive. So let's talk about memory cells. Memory cells take a little bit of time to develop. They're not the body makes those antibodies before it makes the memory cells. It can take two to three weeks after the vaccine was given to make those um, memory cells. And that's why our vaccine protocols, you're going to notice, are usually four weeks apart so that the body has had time to create those memory cells in between each vaccine. Memory cells don't live forever though. Um, they're a living cell just like all the other things in our bodies and um, they do die off and that's why we need to revaccinate to make a new generation of those memory cells so that's why we do boosters periodically like let's say every three years so vaccine administration how do we give vaccines all animals um, so pups and dogs or cats and kittens Regardless of their age, regardless of their weight, their breed, or their gender, they're all given the same vaccine dose. Most vaccine doses are one mil. Um, if you want to have a systemic response, which means the whole body has a response to the vaccine, you need to inject that vaccine or the animal needs to eat it. Um, we can also create a localized response um, if we give a vaccine into the eyes or the nose. So typically we're not going to really do the eyes, um, but we do Bordetella into the nose often. Um, that gives immunity right where you need it, in the nose, because Bordetella is an airborne bacteria that uh, is picked up by dogs right in the nose. So if you have a localized response, right there it's going to actually be more protective for that illness than um, if you had a systemic response in order to vaccinate the animal has to be healthy if they're sick the re re immune response is going to be poor um, the vaccine isn't going to give them any protective immunity and they could actually even get sick from the vaccine so if people give you grief about not being able to get the vaccine because their pet was sick um, let them know you're actually saving them money because they could be getting sick from the vaccine, like even sicker. And um, they're not really even going to build any immunity from getting the vaccine. So you'd just be taking their money and the animal wouldn't be getting any benefit. So the steps to vaccine administration. Number one, we want to examine the pet and make sure they're healthy and able to receive that vaccine. Number two, we want to make sure the correct, correct site of administration is clean. So if we're going to give it sub Q, which means under the skin, and we're going to do that over the left shoulder, um, we want to make sure that that site is clean. Um, that means like clean off any visible dirt, etc. But we don't want to use any alcohol. Alcohol can kill vaccine um, agents, right? So things like the bacteria and the virus that are in there, alcohol can kill it. So we don't want to use alcohol to clean the vaccination site because there's potential to damage the vaccine with it. Then we want to administer the vaccine as recommended by the manufacturer. So does it go sub Q? Does it go IM? Does it go IV? Does it go into the nose? Does it go into the mouth? Where are we putting it? And then we need to document the vaccination in the pet's file. So vaccine vials have a cute little label on it that peels off so nicely and you stick that sticker right into the file if you have paper files and that documents that they were vaccinated with that vaccine. It has the lot number, the expiry date on there and what type of vaccine it was. So all that information is right there. You just need to initial it and um, well the doctor does and state where they gave the vaccine on the, on the animal's body. So where can we give vaccinations? We have a few different routes. 
Um, we can give them by injection. Typically, it's going to be sub-Q. Some vaccines can go IM or sub-Q. You're going to pick sub-Q. <laughs> um, IM injections are much more painful than a sub-Q injection. So if you can choose sub-Q, you do choose sub-Q. Um, so in your textbook, you can see Elsevier pages 197. Uh, it gives you a table in there, 7-4, that gives you examples of vaccines that are injectable. There is also the intranasal choice. Um, so Bordetella is one I talked about already. Kennel cough, that is an intranasal vaccine. And then oral vaccines. So Bordetella is available as an oral vaccine. And also wildlife rabies vaccines are typically given as an oral um, administration. So it's like basically like meat laced with the vaccine. They eat it up and then they're vaccinated for rabies. So we can talk about our vaccine types. This is something that's going to be on your uh, brochure. So this first note, you don't need to know for the brochure, but the wild strain or the field strain, that's the disease causing form of the virus out in the wild, okay? Um, and then remember that the portion of the virus that the body reacts to is the antigen and the antigen is the proteins on the surface of the virus. So like their little hat that they're wearing. So an inactivated or a killed vaccine uh, means that it's non-infectious. Uh, it's made from microbes that are chemically heat treated, or sorry, chemically or heat treated to kill them. So they're dead. Um, typically dead vaccines or killed vaccines are gonna contain adjuvants. Adjuvants are substances that enhance the immune response. Um, usually it increases the stability of the vaccine in the body. The problem with adjuvants is that they could cause vaccine reactions. Killed vaccines are the ones that we see the most reactions in animals with. And that's because of the um, levels of adjuvants. So the advantages of an inactive or a killed vaccine is that it's not gonna cause disease, it's dead. Um, so it's really safe to use and it is really stable. But disadvantages, it takes a lot more doses to build that immunity. Uh, we have a lot poorer of a response compared to other ones, and it's a bigger chance of a possible vaccine reaction because of the adjuvants. Um, our next type is the attenuated or modified live. So these are microorganisms that are alive, but they've been modified so that they're not virulent or able to cause disease, but they're still able to replicate in the patient. Because they're able to replicate, we're gonna see longer immunities, better efficacy, and a quicker stimulation of that immune response. But disadvantages, it could cause abortion in pregnant animals. It could produce a mild form of the disease because it is alive still. And that can be shed in the environment. So we need to be careful about that. Also proper handling and storage is critical. Most vaccines need to be kept in the fridge any kind of temperature fluctuations within a, a modified live can damage the vaccine and make it not very effective. We could have a fully live vaccine. It's fully virulent. We're giving you an injection of the virus. Um, this doesn't really get done anymore because <laughs> it's not very safe. Um, that means you're giving <laughs> live microbes. So advantages, fewer doses are needed that immunity is gonna last a lot longer because it's the real thing. Um, it's pretty inexpensive because you don't have to kill it or modify it. Um, and there are no adjuvants, so you have a much less chance of reaction. But disadvantages, um, there is virulence there. It is potential to get sick from that vaccine and it is potential for you to get sick from just handling the vaccine. So you have to be careful handling it. And then lastly, we have the recombinant. Recombinant is a fairly common um, type of vaccine, especially for your more aggressive or dangerous viruses. So um, when you have a recombinant, a gene or the antigen of the microorganism is removed and then inserted into a non-pathogenic microorganism. So the example is canary pox. It's a safe and effective vector and it doesn't need an adjuvant. So what the heck does that mean? So basically what we do 
if you think of rabies as wearing the rabies hat, the hat being its antigen, and canary pox does, is wearing a different hat. You can take the rabies hat or antigen off of rabies and put it onto your canary pox. And then canary pox can go into the body and it's just hanging out, it's going for a nice walk in the park. It's not dangerous at all, but it's got the rabies hat on and your body's gonna say, hey, whoa, rabies is here, let's go fight it off. So um, it's basically like putting a little um, mask or a hat onto canary pox and tricking your body into thinking that it's rabies. Uh, so this is pretty effective. There's lots of good advantages. There's not a lot of side effects because it doesn't need an adjuvant. Um, it's really effective in terms of immune response because the body thinks it's a real live virus. Um, it, there's a lot of different routes of administration. Um, safety is really big with this one. It's a lot, it's really safe to use and it is absolutely impossible to produce the disease. So rabies isn't present, just rabies hat is there. Um, canary pox is not going to cause any illnesses ever. So that's a safe one for, to wear the hat in. Okay. Uh, disadvantages is though, as I'm sure you can imagine, it is fairly costly to take hats off of tiny viruses and put them onto other tiny viruses. So um, it's fairly expensive because you have to pay for the lab costs of building those vaccines. So handling vaccines, we need to protect vaccines from temperature extremes. Most vaccines need to be stored in the fridge. Um, so we don't want them staying out at room temperature for long periods of time. We don't want them going in the freezer. We want them staying at that pretty steady fridge temperature. Vaccines should be protected from UV light, which means that they're not, you know, hanging out inside, or um, I mean, right inside the window. We don't want them being exposed to sunlight. Um, when you are reconstituting vaccines, so vaccines will often come in with two vials. One has a little freeze-dried disc at the bottom containing the vaccine. Um, and then there is a little vial that comes with it called the diluent. Uh, the diluent is um, specific to that vaccine. So you want to only use the diluent that comes with it. So that means you don't use diluents from other boxes or from a different vaccine altogether. You use the diluents that came with that vial. You drop the diluent, you pour it into, well, you don't pour it, you inject it into the um, bottle with the vaccine in it. It turns into a liquid and then you can inject that into the body. You do not want to mix vaccines in the same syringe unless that's re recommended by the manufacturer. I guess some people have the idea that one poke is better than three, so they want to draw three vaccines into one syringe and then just give one injection. That isn't safe to do. Uh, those vaccines could end up damaging each other in that syringe, so we don't want to do that. Also, if the animal has a vaccine reaction at the site, you won't know which vaccine caused it. So then what do you do? How do you know what vaccine is the problem for the animal? Vaccines, once they are reconstituted, so once you've mixed the diluent and that freeze-dried puck, they need to be used as soon as possible. Um, so I've had times where doctors have accidentally mixed the wrong vaccine. I will let that vaccine hang around for like up to half a day. So if they, re, if they mixed it in the morning and they hadn't used it by noon, I would throw it out over lunch hour. If they mixed it in the evening, if it wasn't used by the end of the day, I would throw it out. You want to use the entire recommended dose of vaccine. Uh, so most of the time that is going to be one mil. There are some companies now that are selling um, half dose vaccines. So they're um, just the half a mil and they are recommending those for like really small dogs. Um, that is certainly, I think a good marketing thing to advertise if you are doing those in your clinic. Um, Cause some, lots of people that have small dogs want that smaller dose. Um, but personally, uh, I kind of think it is just that. It's a marketing scam. I mean scheme. <laughs> uh, 
Um, if you are using a multi-dose vial, there's an increased risk of contamination, which makes sense. The more often you poke a vial, the more likely you are to introduce a contaminant. In small animal medicine, we do not use multi-dose vials. That is a large animal thing. When you're administering a vaccine, make sure you're using proper animal restraint. You need to use the route of administration recommended by the manufacturer. The injection site has to be clean of dirt or debris, but you don't want to use alcohol. And you need to document the vaccine administration in the animal's medical record. So what needs to be documented? The vaccine type, the name of the vaccine, the manufacturer, the serial number or lot number, the expiration date. So all of those things are located on the sticker. The other three things are things that you will need to add in. The date of administration, the route of administration, and the administration site or where it was given. Uh, so let's talk about vaccine reactions. This is something else that's going to end up in your brochure as well. So the risks associated with vaccination is very, very small. Um, vaccines are very safe. The benefits of giving a vaccine far outweigh any of the potential risks associated with it, which is why we recommend vaccination as a very effective prophylactic treatment to keep animals healthy and safe. There are possible reactions though, anaphylaxis being the most serious one. Anaphylaxis is an allergic reaction. When an animal has an anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine, they're not reacting to the vaccine like the agent or whatever, they're, they're reacting to the adjuvant. So when we see anaphylaxis, we're gonna see clinical signs and they're gonna be very sudden onset. We could see vomiting, we could see diarrhea. Uh, we're gonna see swelling of the face. We're gonna see pruritus, remember that means itchiness. Respiratory distress, they might be having difficulty breathing. They might have hives. Their mucous membranes might be pale. So remember if we lift the gums and have, or lift the lip and look at the gums, they might be pale. They could have cold limbs, a fast heart rate, a weak pulse. Uh, they could just be weak in general, like their stature. Um, they could be experiencing shock, seizure, coma, and then death if they're not treated. So an anaphylaxi anaphylactic reaction is very serious and it needs immediate emergency medical attention. Uh, so basically, if an animal is experiencing anaphylaxis, get them to the hospital right away. It is an emergency. Um, we're gonna treat it. We're gonna probably get them on IV fluids. We're gonna be treating for shock. We're gonna give them oxygen to help the respiratory distress. We're gonna give them an antihistamine because that will help with the allergic reaction. We're going to give them a steroid injection to calm down the immune response. And we can give them epinephrine, especially if they're in that seizure coma death section. This is going to be most common with killed vaccines because they have more chemicals uh, in the form of those adjuvants. So they're a more dangerous uh, vaccination in terms of anaphylactic risk. There is, however, a kind of quote unquote normal reaction. So if an animal experiences these, this is fairly normal, um, but we do want owners to know about it and be aware so that they can monitor it. So we can see clinical signs. They might just be kind of lethargic after getting their vaccines, kind of tired. They might be anorexic, not wanting to eat. You might see localized swelling or pain at the injection site for a couple days and they could have a mild fever after. Those are normal reactions. Those are normal reactions in humans as well if we get vaccines. So the treatment for a normal vaccine reaction is to monitor it at home. It typically resolves on its own in 24 to 48 hours. If it goes beyond that, so if greater than that 48 hours, or if the owner is concerned, call the hospital. We will get the animal in for recheck. Uh, we are concerned about animals that aren't back to normal after a day or two after vaccines. So what if a dog has had a previous vaccine reaction? Typically, we're going to not ever give multiple vaccines at the same time again to that animal. We're always going to split vaccines up. 
um, we are going to vaccinate less frequently. So we're going to see if we can get away with not vaccinating them as often. We could try using a different brand. It might be that just the chemicals in that specific brand cause the reaction, but others won't. But typically we're usually just not going to use that specific vaccine that gave them an issue. Um, and we could give an a steroid or antihistamine injection beforehand. That will help to dull the allergic response to the vaccine. So there are some rarer possible reactions. Um, personally, I would not talk about these in the brochure. I would focus on the anaphylaxis and the normal reaction. I wouldn't get into these weird ones. Um, so other rarer reactions, we might see allergies get worse after um, a vaccination. That's because allergies are an immune response. Having a vaccination develops an immune response. Uh, for puppies less than five weeks vaccinated with a distemper modified live vaccine, they could develop neurological symptoms because of inflammation of the brain. Question for you. Hold on, let me get something. Question for you. Should animals at five weeks be getting vaccines? Let's see. Hmm, two, four, six, so right in the middle. Of five. Huh, no, because they're protected by maternal antibodies. So that's why I wouldn't me bother mentioning that one. They shouldn't be even getting that vaccine anyway. Uh, it is possible to get an allergic uveitis, which causes like a blue eye look, from canine adenovirus type 1. We do not give a adenovirus type 1 anymore. We give an adenovirus type 2, and it protects against type 2 and type 1. We'll learn about that more when we talk about the canine illnesses specifically. Um, if you give a Bordetella or parainfluenza vaccine, those are both respiratory illnesses. They might cause mild respiratory symptoms in animals that just received that vaccine. We talked already that modified live vaccines can cause birth defects or abortion. And there are vaccine related sarcomas in cats. I'm going to save that conversation. Hold on, I think. Yes, I'm going to save that conversation for when we're talking about cat vaccines specifically. Um, so vaccine titers, we briefly talked about these already. Why would we want to do them? Well, for one thing, um, one thing we should be aware of, I mean, is that they're expensive. They are very expensive compared to revaccination. For instance, if you were to give your dog the distemper parvo combo, it protects your dog against distemper, adenovirus type two and type one, uh, parainfluenza and parvovirus. So that's like five illnesses, right? Um, if you were wanting to avoid, oh, sorry, if you gave that vaccine, like you'd be spending under $100 for the exam and the vaccine, and you're protecting your animal against five different viruses. If you want to run titers to see if your animal is protected to not have to bother vaccinating them, it's like 350 or so per illness. So it's pretty expensive. Um, some of the, I feel like maybe Parvo was a little bit less, but like they're pretty expensive running titers. So if an owner tells you, oh, I don't want to vaccinate, the responsible thing to do is to do vaccine titers to see if the animal is protected. Most of the time when you tell them that, those owners are going to say, uh, yeah, you know, just book the vaccines because it's cheaper. Um, so what do titers do? They check the blood titer for levels of antibody to a specific disease. So basically they just count how many antibodies are available in the blood to protect against that illness. If the antibody titer is below the level that prov provides protective immunity, we need to give that animal a vaccination booster. If it's above, we consider them protected, right? Um, if it's below, we're going to consider them susceptible to that illness. So let's talk about our vaccine recommendations then for dogs. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of gloss over this pretty quickly because we're gonna talk about this more in our canine unit. So core vaccines for dogs, distemper, adenovirus, type two, parvovirus, those are given at eight, 12, and 16 weeks. So you'll see four weeks apart, right? That's to allow for the creation of the memory cells. They'll be given at, oh, and sorry, eight, 12, 8, 12, and 16 weeks means that we're going to be hopefully giving them some protection in here. If not, we're definitely getting response here. 
And when we booster this vaccine, it's gonna give us an even higher response at that 16 weeks. Um, and then we also wanna booster that one year later. So at 16 weeks and then one year later. And then we can give a booster for that every three years. For rabies, we're gonna give just one vaccine at 16 weeks. We booster that again a year later, and then we get boosters every three years. Those are our core vaccines for dogs. Non-core, we have some options. Oh, wow, look at these, hey? Uh, we have Bordetella. Bordetella is kennel cough. It's given at eight and 12 weeks, and then you can booster that annually. Parainfluenza, eight and 12 weeks, then boosted annually. Lyme disease, 12 weeks and 16 weeks, then boosted annually. Leptospirosis, um, it's not the most effective and also causes vaccine reactions. That can be given at 12 weeks, 16 weeks, and then boosted annually. Influenza H3N8 can be given at 12 weeks, 16 weeks, and then annually. And then there are vaccines available for Giardia and coronavirus, not COVID-19, um, but uh, a dog-specific coronavirus. Uh, but those vaccines aren't recommended. They're not super effective. So for dogs, where do we give vaccines? DA2PP, distemper, adenovirus type 2, parvo, and parainfluenza. That goes into the right shoulder. Rabies goes into the right hind, so over like the hip area. Bordetella is going into the left shoulder or intranasal, depending which type you have and Lyme will give over the left hind. So this is, might, might be different clinic to clinic, but I find like this is pretty consistent with what I've seen in practice, but I could see some doctors doing it differently. And then for cats, their core vaccines, rhinotracheitis is also known as a herpes virus, Khaleesi virus and panleukopenia. Those guys are given at eight, 12, and 16 weeks at one year, and then boosted every one to three years. Rabies, we're gonna give it somewhere between 12 and 16 weeks, typically 16, then boosted a year later, and then boosted every three years. There are one year rabies for cats. Um, I think the three year rabies virus, or rabies vaccine is safer though for cats. Non-core vaccines. Feline leukemia, um, we're going to give that at 8 and 12 weeks and then booster that annually. There is FIP, Chlamydophila, and Bordetella, non-core as well. Um, I'm honestly not sure that any of those are super effective. I would like to point out Bordetella for cats. What? Wasn't that in the dog list too? Yeah, you can give the dog Bordetella to cats as well because it does cross species there. Um, I will be honest though, I've never seen it done but it could be. Um, and then where do we give those vaccines for cats? FBRCP, that's that um, right there, that rhinotracheitis is feline viral rhinotracheitis, that's the FBR. And then C is Khaleesi, P is panleukopenia. FBRCP is given over the right shoulder, rabies is given over the right hind, and then feline leukemia is given over the left hind. So that is our introductory material going over uh, stuff about immunity and um, vaccines. I didn't necessarily get into how vaccines work here, but I will post a nice article for you to read that gives you good details on that. Um, I think it's important to know how vaccines work, A, because it's part of your assignment. Um, it's in the brochure, right? <laughs> and, um, and B, because owners might ask you and it's important for you to be able to know. So if you do have any questions about any of this, please make sure you do ask. I'm available in the chat, I'm available in the virtual classroom, and I'm always available by email. So feel free to reach out with any questions you do have. Thank you for listening to the video lecture for our test one material. Thank you.